thanks everyone for joining the um, the talk today from Michael Irwin. So really excited to have him talk about his work on uh, metal halide perovskite materials for uh, solar photovoltaics. So uh, I guess as an academic myself, I'm really excited to hear uh, an industrial perspective for, from Michael about these materials, super interesting. Uh, Michael received a, a BA in chemistry in 2003 from Texas A&M, a PhD in inorganic chemistry from Northwestern University in 2009, uh, he currently holds 26 issued U.S. patents, over 30 issued international patents, has 18 publications, and he's currently CTO of Hunt Perovskite Technologies, where he focuses on the development of metal halide perovskite materials and their application in solar photovoltaics. So, uh, Michael, go ahead. We're really looking forward to it. Great. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so again, my name is Michael. Uh, thank you all for your uh, attendance. Let me get the screen shared here. Um, so I've I've calculated this uh, presentation here to hopefully be well short of the hours. So we have plenty of time to talk, and if not, you'll be able to give your time back to you. So perovskites, I think most people in this call are probably familiar with them. You'll get some extra extra background and I made it a little bit generic in terms of uh, PV and how this relates to PV the PV industry for those who who may uh, need that extra background but you know perovskite's been a fun a fun ride because we've been in it since 2013 and during that time period the majority of the work has come from the academics right and so we've watched this thing grow and it, it has been a material that has unique properties, as many of you may know or understand and understand that things that weren't well defined, right, by traditional semiconductor physics and otherwise. We had to kind of fumble along on the way trying to, trying to learn how to do what we're doing, um, how to understand the material so we can make the modifications necessary to, to achieve a high performance and durable perovskite um, solar PV device. So to get started, um, who is Hunt, right? It's the Hunt Perovskite Technology. So Hunt is an 86-year-old company. Um, it all started with the acquisition of oil well called uh, the Daisy Bradford Number no. 3 by H.L. Hunt uh, in, back in 1930. H.L. Um, Hunt had a very colorful, colorful life. Um, Hunt is now led by uh, his son, Ray Hunt, um, and his grandson, uh, Hunter Hunt, on the Hunt Energy side and his uh, son-in-law, Chris Kleinert, um, on the investment side and real estate side. We're headquartered in downtown Dallas, there's a picture of our building. As you might imagine, it's kind of a ghost town right now, as I'm sure most offices in the world are. Um, but we participate, oil and gas, LNG, power real estate, there's kind of a large breadth of diversified company that all started again with just one single, one single oil well. But how do we fit in? Um, we're in a division called Hunt Energy Enterprises that's a venture that will bring in, provide funds and workspace to develop a technology. Um, there has been one really great example of another spin out. Uh, it's called Motive Drilling Technology, which was purchased by or acquired by H&P a few years ago. Um, it's a directional drilling technology that allows you to um, set a path for the drill bit to make the whole process more efficient, less time on the on the well. And so, you know, it's it's all about trying to be efficient, right? So Hunt Oil has now been uh, ha been restructured and its name has now become uh, Hunt Energy from Hunt Oil, right? Showing this transition from not just, you know, trying to extract uh, petroleum from the ground to create energy, um, but energy in its uh, larger, larger sense. So Hunt Perovskite Technologies in particular, we focus on, uh, you know, we're really kind of more of a materials company with the general hypothesis that we're trying to answer is, is that the perovskite, the metal halide perovskite material, is it a viable semiconductor, particularly for PV applications? It's not so much trying to develop a PV device and the next gen device or trying to develop a module per se, right? That's ultimately, of course, the goal. But perovskite is a new material and semiconductor, a completely new class of semiconductor uh, in most, people, uh, most people's eyes, is something we really need to prove first and foremost. And we'll demonstrate that hopefully a few times throughout the course of the presentation today. But we were the first to synthesize the pure alpha phase uh, from a medinium uh, lead iodide. 
Um, some people are still trying to do that and focusing on that. Uh, we were an early adopter of the inverted PIN architecture. I come from an organic photovoltaic background. And in such, you know, I, I made a perovskite solar cell how I knew how, right? The way I knew how. I mean, it's the way I was trained in graduate school kind of luckily worked out for us. I don't come from a DSAC background. I have done DSSC, but that's not my primary background. And I felt with the way this material uh, was showing, you know, its functionality in these early publications, that it would be better suited to a more OPV-like architecture. We have one of the largest patent portfolios in the space uh, internationally. We operate in a 4,000 square foot kind of custom design bespoke lab in downtown Dallas, uh, 7,700 square foot total. Um, all of our fabrication is using commercially scalable methods. So it, it's still R&D-like in its scope, but everything can be transferred to a manufacturing scale. We have high throughput durability testing we'll talk about today. And of course, an absolutely world-class uh, world class team. So just a couple of shots of the lab. So you know it's real. I mentioned that the lab is in downtown Dallas. People are like, really? I mean, how? All right, so there it is um, and all of its all of its glory, um, including our our handy dandy little uh, slot die coder right down there in the lower lower left. So quickly, a few words on solar PV for those who may need the, the primer here. So while solar as an energy source, why is that important? Why does that matter? Well, I mean, it's, once it's clean, right? It's, it's the sun is already shining. It's going to keep shining, God willing, every day. And the logistics of the solar energy collection then therefore are, are easy, right? You've got the sun shining all across the earth. Now, of course, the sun does go down um, and generates what we call this duck curve here in the bottom where you have the blue line representing uh, power demand throughout the course of the day. This increases until the end of the day around. Okay, so why solar PV? Uh, there's a few different ways to, to collect um, solar energy. One great one is through uh, photovoltaics, utilizing the photovoltaic effect. It's direct photon to electron conversion, other than maybe solar thermal, we're using the heat generated from the sun to, to power. Um, you're independent of the grid, solid state electronics. No, there's no real moving parts unless you have a tracker. Um, high public opinion acceptance, and so, People generally like to have uh, panels in place of, say, a uh, coal plant, definitely a coal plant, but even so, maybe a natural gas plant. But as I was saying, when we kind of cut off there, you know, solar is a great way to produce power, but I think it's part of a bigger energy mix, right? So you got to have at least a few different things to make sure that you can power yourself, uh, your, your community in a stable way. Again, as, as California is demonstrating right now, maybe that's batteries, maybe it's some mixture of uh, fossil fuels still with solar and wind, but you know, that's for others to figure out. So what matters in utility scale solar PV? So that's where we focus. We're making utility scale uh, panels. So you have the power purchase agreement. That is the, um, the price or the cost of the uh, solar energy that's being generated, uh, bankability. So that's something that's really important for perovskite. It's a new technology, right? So it's something that's, has not yet been proven. And so if you want someone to uh, sponsor or finance a multi-million dollar deal under a PPA and you're gonna use a perovskite panel, well, we better prove this panel will last as long as we say. If we say it's gonna last 20 years, we need good data to support that. And that's bankability. Uh, we'll talk about cost per watt. So that's a typical standard here. Uh, cost per watt in you know the manufacturing component or CapEx. And then what does it actually cost to make the cell? Uh, in a uh, or the module in a cost per watt basis. Um, a standard panel these days is around 400 watts, um, for example. Uh, durability, mentioned that in terms of bankability there, and then nameplate DC power, that's actually what the, the panel will produce. That's what I said about the 400, uh, 400 watts. You also got soft costs. You got a lot of people working in the background. So these people who are financing the deal, and that's, that's not free, right? You have electricians, installation uh, uh, labor, um, customer acquisition, particularly in the um, residential market, is, is quite expensive. How much money and marketing costs is it to get one customer? Um, and then the typical power plant here over on the right, you know, in addition to the solar panels, you have inverters. Right? You have inverters. You may have batteries. That's kind of the new thing. Transformer before um, the electricity can be uh, put onto the high voltage uh, lines into the grid and then monitoring and a few other things. But I show this to demonstrate that the solar panels are only part of a PV power plant, right? They're the most important part. Without them, the plant doesn't work, it doesn't function, but you do have to have other components. So there are other components that weigh on the cost, the overall cost, 
um, the installed cost. Uh, so the panels, we can make them more efficient or cost less, and this will definitely have an effect on the PV power plants, but there are other things that are important too that drive the overall, overall cost. So let's get to the matter at hand. So metal halide perovskites. I've been asked uh, many times, what is a metal halide perovskite or just a perovskite more colloquially speaking. Uh, and so what I've done is in that definition, I like to include what is a metal halide perovskite to me or better said to uh, hunt perovskite technologies. So to us, it's a revolutionary class, uh, new class of ink based printable yet high performance semiconductors. Both have been done before, but never in the same bucket, right? So you can have an ink based uh, semiconductor like, you know, an organic photovoltaic and an OPV cell that can be printed, but it's not very high performance. They're definitely getting better in the last few years, mind you. Um, and then a high performance semiconductor is obviously nothing new either in the case of particularly gamma arsenide. Uh, but never before had the two been in the same, the same bucket that we can leverage both. You know, you take an application such as a, um, say a portable charger, right, that you want to put on, say, a tablet or charger computer, some sort of outdoor gadget, typically made out of uh, amorphous silicon, which run somewhere in the ballpark about 6% light to power conversion efficiency. So it doesn't make a very effective So take a similar application, utilize perovskite at 20 plus percent, percent efficiency, then you've got something that can really generate a significant amount of power to do what you need to do to charge whatever you're trying to time. So the value proposition of the HPT perovskite cell. So we have calculated through our extensive modeling, the capex. So the cost to build the plant is gonna be less than eight cents per watt. The panel to produce will be less than nine cents per watt. This is based on a three gigawatt uh, model. Um, as we can see in, in um, other countries focusing on silicon manufacture, um, they're going to the, you know, from a one gigawatt size plant to uh, much larger ones. And so we're, we're modeling based on those trends. It's very high throughput manufacturing. You'll see since this stuff is printed, um, everything can be made into a small footprint. You don't need large vapor deposition systems. And then the, the printers, they can work, work quite fast, you know, sheet to sheet or, or roll to roll. We focus on sheet to sheet, but you coat and go, coat and go, coat and go. Um, we've been modeling at about a five uh, meter per minute uh, tack time which isn't actually all that fast. All the materials are inexpensive and readily available. In the current energy markets, this is an issue with things like uh, uh, cobalt, as we all probably well know. Uh, it doesn't always come from the best of places. It always doesn't, uh, it's maybe not sustainably resourced. Um, however, it's a lesser of the evils, right? That we've got um, cobalt that we need to, to utilize in our lithium ion batteries, right? So, in addition to, to these primary financial components, also it's a high performer, already exceeding uh, current Thymtum technologies um, on the lab scale and efficiency. Um, you can tune its chemistry and tune its electronic and um, optical properties, many flexible, low mass, amongst other things. Mass, not mass. And so what about the, the devices? How are these things made? How are they put together? And so there's a few principal ways that these things are constructed, what they're constructed of. Um, we're utilizing what we call the PIN planar architecture, and we utilize blade coating or slot, uh, it's called slot casting here in this graphic. I, I stole this, this is not mine. Um, slot die coating uh, is what we call it. And we principally focus on the form of adenium lead iodide uh, chemistry. It's not pure anymore. And no, I won't tell you what all is in there, um, but it's in principle, primarily form of medinium lead iodide. So how do we make our cells? Uh, we again use slot die coating or, or blade coating. Um, we start with the conductive substrate. We print the whole selective contact. We print the uh, perovskite precursors. You anneal to make the fully formed perovskite. And then you print the electron selective contact. And then finally, we still use some vapor deposition. So uh, uh, thermal evaporation for metal electrodes. We haven't moved away from that yet, but you thermally evaporate the electrodes and then you can package it up in a, in a module here with an edge seal. Um, the data that I'll show today are from non-hermetically sealed, but we will uh, start off by showing you this is actually where we're heading at the, at the moment. Okay, so 
our work all started where I think a lot of you who have worked in perovskites have started. And these are very small 25 millimeter substrates, same size I use in OPV, same size I use in DSSE. Um, but the majority of our work has actually been here in the middle category, the 50 millimeter substrate. This is one we anticipate using for quite some time. Uh, this is our, our principal test coupon. In our layout, we have uh, six pixels per substrate, so six individual devices to help statistics. Um, this isn't great for series resistance, and so we, you know, the, the, the performance is scaled or skewed uh, low, uh, a little bit low. Um, but this is our primary test coupon we intend to use um, on a go-forward basis. But our, pr our principal research at the moment is on this 150 millimeter module. A size that's familiar, um, <clears throat> a size that's familiar to the to the PV industry. Something I think everyone's comfortable with. There's existing uh, carriers and everything for the 150, so it's a nice a nice next up uh, uh, next step up in size. Or we can focus on making striped cells instead of pixelated cells. Uh, focus on uh, the serial connection required for a large panel, um, amongst other things, being a 9x uh, increase in size. And then I think last but not least, making sure that every layer in the uh, device is uh, slot die coated, right? Maybe not the back electrode, that may be put down by another method, but the, the semiconductor and the, the contact layer will be put down by slot die coating to, to capture, that, um, capture that value. So here are our first uh, 150 millimeter modules. Uh, and I was quite proud to hold that. It took six years to, to get to that place from 2006, uh, 13, when we got all started. And then one of the roles of this 120 or uh, 150 millimeter substrate is as a, uh, as a demonstrator. And so we have USB electronics in the back. You can plug into it. That's not quite finished yet, but we're, we're almost there. A nice little pretty uh, uh, frame that'll go around it. Um, It'll actually be aluminum when we're done. This was just recently uh, printed um, by uh, FDM, what most people call 3D printing, uh, fused deposition modeling, printed a prototype frame to show what the demonstrator would, uh, would look like. And so what's been important on the 150 millimeter substrate? Um, obviously uniformity, right? The homogeneity um, of, the, of the coat in terms of thickness, uh, chemistry, and so on and so forth. Uh, the perovskite system is formed in situ, meaning that if you step back here, as we're coating the we we'll call the perovskite ink here in the in the second step, we're coating a solution-based precursor or an ink. Um, that ink then you anneal and cook, and then it converts into the perovskite in situ. So you have a crystallization and thin foam form, uh, formation process occurring uh, from a solution-based uh, ink. And so as you coat that, as you can imagine, there are quite a few issues that occur along the way. And so some of the ways that we've been uh, trying to understand the uniformity is one, we took a entire 150 millimeter substrate, chopped it up into 50 millimeter coupons, uh, did thin film XRD measurements on them. You can see that it's, the, the chemistry or the crystal structure is quite uh, consistent uh, in all nine quadrants. And then uh, here on the right, on the top here, we have uh, photoluminescence image images. Uh, we do lots of uh, metrology type work in the lab as well. Again, we're not going to assume that metrology tools that were developed for um, existing PV technologies or semiconductors would be um, valid for use in a perovskite system. So we're developing our own. So here's a PL image, and you can see starting here um, on the on the left, uh, this is an earlier coat. You can see some problems with the coating process, lots of hem homogeneities. And as we further developed on um, the material has become quite a bit more uh, consistent. Uh, you'll see in the PL image, you know, uh, photoluminescence is oftentimes an indicator of the quality of the semiconductor. You'll see that this section is much brighter than the rest of this. That brightness with the contrasting dark area is usually due to uh, chemical inhomogeneity, so it's not a good thing. When you see something like here on the right, this is more uh, what you're looking for. And those dots about the center, those are the LEDs uh, for illumination for the PL image. So that's no, that's not part of the device. And the lower step, we see no electronics attached to it, no electrodes. And it's got these scratches on it here. Those are for uh, profilometry, mechanical stylus profilometry. So we just make a little mark in nine places and then measure the thickness. You can see a clear differentiation in the color in this lower left going to the right. So it's, you don't need a profilometer. You don't really need a tool to say, okay, this is not a perfect coat. 
but we need to know by how much so we quantify it with profilometry and then we can figure out how to adjust that further and as we modify the ink chemistry and the, the, the coding methodologies to make it more homogeneous um, we can again quantify that and uh, and measure how the different parameters in the parameter space uh, affect the thickness all right so I kind of added that 150 stuff last minute because I want to give a new flavor to somebody who may have seen this presentation or, or a similar version of it uh, before. But jumping back into what is important to, to HPT, in the beginning we found that, that performance was not really uh, an issue. It was in fact durability that was the biggest problem. And so uh, starting in 2014, we've always focused on that. Now the, the hard part of that is, is that, uh, and this is, you know, from an academic perspective, this is this is quite uh, quite dangerous. Um, and so, if you've got uh, efficiency versus time, we would bring our efficiency up to a, a nice number, find the problems in the device, and the efficiency would plummet. Now, I don't know about you, if I'm a graduate student, I don't want to tell my professor that, you know, I had an 18% cell, I changed some things, it made it more durable, sure, but now it's 2% efficient. You know, that's a that's a hard conversation. But this is what we had to do, right? And so then the next step, we bring the efficiency back up, change something to make it more durable, and then it goes back down and so on and so forth. But of course, this, uh, this minima has uh, decreased over time, thankfully. So what is our general approach? Now, as mentioned in the beginning, I'm a, I'm a chemist, and so I had a bias towards the chemistry of the, uh, of the system, right? Trying to create a better perovskite that was more intrinsically durable, not just trying to package it up or just um, or, or just push through the problems, right? Um, we wanted to start off uh, with a uh, intrinsically stable. Uh, starting with materials level durability, the concept of building on the rock, we approached uh, composition of matter first. We, like many, started with a methyl ammonium lead halide system, found that it had issues. From an organic chemistry perspective, if there's solvent present or any kind of solvent where the, the, the ions can be mobile, it's intrinsically unstable. And we knew that uh, crystallographically, geometrically, that form of medinium lead iodide should definitely work uh, following the, the famous Goldschmidt factors. And so we endeavored to do so. At the time in 14, everyone says, you know, don't, don't even try FAPBI3, there's no point. It just uh, polymorphs into the hexagonal structure. You can't make the cubic structure that you want. Uh, so just stick with methyl ammonium. That wasn't really a good answer. Um, a lot of people tried some different doping methodologies, uh, amalgamating, probably better said. Uh, but that's what we what we did, and we were able to do so, and that resulted in this patent with a couple uh, sister patents along the way. The ink chemistry itself, uh, how do we actually form the perovskite material, right? So we got precursors, we dissolved them in a solvent. Uh, that's just a pure solvent, say like DMF, uh, is not good enough. So you have to put in different things to control the drying rate and the viscosity and a bunch of other stuff. So the ink chemistry was very important to forming a good high quality perovskite material. Uh, the next step was the de device level durability. And so we had to make sure the components that were packaged with the perovskite material were also equally durable, that we had good solid interfaces with uh, good physical contact, no delamination, but also um, reliable and efficient charge transfer. To date, in terms of durability, uh, we had some kind of kitschy things here at the, at the beginning that we did before uh, we had good testing systems, um, but we started with uh, 30 years. Uh, it's actually where it's a 10 sun system. It's one uh, one year per week of flux. Um, 64 weeks, the devices were still going fine, but we were holding at 25C. And so we wanted to see what was the effect of elevated temperature. So 85C held its own for a thousand hours and uh, make sure I call that out. When I say the device lives, it means it retained 90% of its original power to, to level set. 85% um, and that passed. So then we combined it with humidity, 85C plus 65% relative humidity, that worked well. Um, then we wanted to combine light plus heat, 
So we did UV light plus heat and then white light um, plus heat at 50 and 75 C um, respectively. All um, maintained 90% of their power after 1000 hours. Um, we have extended data, but the, you know, we're a company, secrecy is kind of part of what we do. And so there's a limit, but we have done, we have demonstrated at least what I show here on the screen today. And for again, 100% uh, transparency, this is our test architecture. Uh, it's a non-hermetically sealed uh, structure. So the sides of the device are still uh, readily accessible by the elements. Um, so we have, generally it's ITO, we have a conductive glass substrate, the perovskite material and all the contact layers included with a metal electrode then either epoxy or a laminate and then glass. Typically it's a laminate, we, have, we stopped using epoxy. Um, epoxy died, epoxy based devices die very quickly in the damp heat, uh, as you might, as you might imagine. Um, but this laminate even, uh, depending on what you use, is like EVA, for example, can be a water superhighway all on its own, just shuttling water in and getting it in contact with your device. I'll also mention that the device area is 25 centimeters squared. As in all these cases, what's one centimeter squared? So here's a quick shot of our uh, degradation systems before I show you the data that uh, we realize we need to acquire a lot of data and we need to do it in an automated fashion. So we designed, built, patented uh, uh, numerous systems of design based on this, what you see on the screen here, that will test the cells in an automated way, either starting here in uh, condition number one in a glove box or just on the bench top. But these, both of these systems are just white light at 75C and then uh, UV light. Um, this is actually a fun, um, I, do ha I did have the schematic to show, but I, because this was being recorded, I had to remove it. I, don't, um, I didn't wanna have that as a public record, but we were able to design a PCB that combines light LEDs such that the cells are exposed to UV for aging, and then um, measured under white light UVB for UV, um, excuse me, uh, white light radiation, um, for performance evaluation. And so some examples of the data, you'll see uh, light plus heat durability data shown here with some 80 and 90% demarcation lines. And so again, in the gold 90%, this is a sample of 21 cells. So some, you know, are hanging out just above 80%, some are over 90%, um, but more than enough to demonstrate the fact and I, I included a uh, external quantum efficiency plot here for, for one sample set. So this is uh, six individual cells on a single substrate to demonstrate that when our cells are, are aging under the white light conditions plus uh, the added heat of 75C, it's not necessarily the perovskite that's decomposing. We're actually finding that typically it's the contacts. It's incompatibility with the perovskite material um, with the, the contact layers. Um, without getting into too much detail, this is just to demonstrate that the principal problem lies outside of the perovskite. And if you remember the original hypothesis, um, this is a great bit of data in support of the thesis that yes, we have stabilized the perovskite material. Yes, the, the perovskite can last uh, potentially 20 years. We need to demonstrate that wholly, right? But um, that's gonna be in a fully packaged device. But the perovskite itself, we don't feel um, is an issue. We feel like we've, we've answered that question. Now, there's plenty of problems left to solve. Don't get me wrong, you know, silicon and cadmium telluride research is still going on today in 2020, uh, even though they've been around for a long time. Uh, but we've answered the, the, the original question we had set out to demonstrate when we began this and began this angle in 14 of durability. Yeah, and after a thousand hours, even though the cell uh, is maybe only 90% efficient, you can see in this EQE plot, the solid lines are the measurements before um, the EQE and the dashed lines are after the thousand hours of exposure, and you can see they, the integrated current densities are there. It doesn't have units, but those milliamps per centimeter squared um, next to each uh, pixel uh, designation. So there you go. Um, I think that's that's kind of the key. But to further demonstrate, now this is a little bit wild, right? So this is the UV plus heat. And as I mentioned in the earlier, an earlier part of the, demo, the uh, presentation that the perovskite material itself is actually formed in situ from an ink, right? And so 
you print it and then you heat it or anneal it to form the perovskite. Now, you don't necessarily heat it completely. You know, you put the cookies in the oven, you don't cook them all the way. They're a little bit doughy. And sometimes the cells come out a little bit doughy. Uh, typically, right, when you have a variable at play, you're changing some component, a layer or the chemistry of the perovskite. Um, it doesn't cook all the way. And so we found it specifically under, under UV light, where as with white light, it's quite flat. Um, UV light, you can get all kind of uh, different responses. And so you can see, let me change my marker here to green so you can see it. Like some of these here at the original, the origin, um, they decompose or they age in a very flat way, you know, a more or less linear way. Some slope up strongly. Uh, but as you can see on the y-axis here, this is normalized power conversion uh, efficiency. And so that way you can see all these things overlay. Um, so the efficiencies do vary at time zero, so that you'd see a wildly different plot if it wasn't uh, normalized. Um, but to demonstrate the effect here, yeah, so sometimes the device may anneal in situ, uh, in the, I'm sorry, uh, in, in test or under test. Uh, sometimes it does not. Um, and sometimes it maybe just does it just a, a tiny little bit and then, um, and then go flat after that. But we typically only see this phenomenon for our cell under uh, UV radiation, not under white light or uh, damp heat conditions. Sometimes you do, so in the white light, I gave one demonstrator here. Um, in the, uh, the third data set that I'll show here, damp heat conditions, I, I will point out a little uh, caveat here, um, something for, for normalization, that in this plot and this plot, the light plus heat, those were all in these systems that I showed um, earlier. They're all automated. Um, this is damp heat data, or these are damp heat data. And so they're acquired, um, you know, in a damp heat oven, right? So you put the sample in damp heat oven, you allow it to age, and then you take it out and measure it. We haven't figured out yet how to get all the power electronics, the measurement electronics, and the, and the light source and everything inside of the damp heat oven without them decomposing. Because uh, I don't know if you've used one of these ovens before, but 85 Celsius and 65% relative humidity is quite, uh, quite nasty. Um, but same thing, this is a distribution, this is 39 individual solar cells. You can see we demonstrate quite a few here, maintain their power uh, conversion efficiency at at least 90% of the original measured value after 1,000 hours. And then um, on durability, I like to say, you know, our focus is on durability, but trying to maintain a respectable efficiency. Um, what I'll show here is some 18% data. And I'll, I'll, I'll show it in the uh, stabilized power output format, or what we call steady state internally. Um, we like to present our data in this way so that, that there's, no, there's no qualms about what testing conditions we use. Because um, for those who work in the perovskite field know that you can modulate the scan uh, rates, right? So you're scanning a voltage and measuring a current uh, via a source meter and a, what, hopefully a one sun uh, light source. Um, by changing the scan rate, you can actually change the efficiency of the device. And so we do stabilize power output. We do take it one step further. We like to modulate the lights we expose. All right, so we like to modulate the, the light such that we can show there's not any hysteretic temporal behaviors of any, of any sort. Um, if there were, you would see something of that nature when you turn the light back on. It would just kind of slowly build back up some sort of light soaking effect or whatever. But in our case, uh, turn the light back on, you immediately have uh, power. In this case, that particular plot current uh, immediately there thereafter. Um, a little bit of support there from uh, EQE um, to show the, the current densities. I'm sure everyone wants to see that. Um, but there's some other things that are really important with this device. Uh, one I'd like to highlight is the thermal coefficient here. And so a uh, derivation of the instrument that I showed earlier um, allows us to uh, sweep from uh, low temperature to high temperature, in this case here, 10 Celsius to 70 Celsius, and see how the cell responds. Um, and in doing so, we measured something that's quite, quite low and I think quite provocative, in that silicon and the Series 6 CAT cell panels, you know, based on their uh, data sheet available online, are somewhere in this ballpark for their temperature coefficient meaning that um, somewhere between negative 0.4 and negative uh, 0.35% of their power is lost for every degree Celsius of panel rise, uh, temperature rise, 
Whereas the perovskite system, we're seeing somewhere between you know, negative 0.05 and negative 0.03 um, shown here in the green. I think we're probably being a little bit liberal there, getting that close to zero in this plot. But nonetheless, uh, and what's really provocative about it is kind of two things. So one, or really three things actually. So if you got three individual uh, panels and one is silicon, one is cattail, and one is perovskite, they all have a 400 watt nameplate. You install them all in the same place. The perovskite panel will produce more energy throughout the course of the day than the other two because of this low temperature coefficient. So that's the benefit, right? And that's that's the hope. Now I'll say hope because this is only the one centimeter squared or 25 centimeter squared uh, module size, right? And so will this scale to the full panel? This is something we have to show and we have to prove. So big, huge caveat there. Um, and then further, you know, similar behavior is, can oftentimes be associated with a barrier in the device, meaning that as you heat it, you're applying thermal energy. And if you have a, a barrier to charge collection in your device, that you overcome that barrier with thermal energy. And so that would usually, um, as far as we understand, manifest itself with a particularly responsive uh, fill factor. And the fill factor, which is flat here in this demonstration, uh, would track directly with temperature. So the fill factor would go up with increased temperature, down with decreased temperature, um, overcoming and then you know, reestablishing this, uh, this barrier. So we don't see that in this particular case, right? The, the, the fill factor is quite, quite flat. So how do we really confirm this? And so we did an experiment here where we found a particular set of devices that actually did have a barrier. Um, the, uh, the, the chemistry we found was not complete in its reaction, right? So you would coat the ink, you would heat it, anneal it, and the perovskite wouldn't fully form. And so this form we call the lead iodide shadow. As you can see here in the EQE, this is where the, um, the lead iodide absorbs and it blocks the light where it cannot, um, it absorbs, because lead iodide is a semiconductor also, absorbs light, it can't get to the perovskite, it can't create uh, charge carriers. So indication of a lead iodide shadow on the left, no lead iodide shadow on the right, and you can see as we start from 25 Celsius and heat up the IV curves on the left, they change dramatically. The serial resistance you can see changes quite significantly as we heat up the 55 C. And so this is a strong indication of uh, such a barrier, right? So if we had lead iodide intermittent in between um, FAPBI3 and uh, nickel oxide, for example, this would act as a charge collection barrier for holes because holes you know, are, are like bubbles. They want to go up in energy but to go through the valence band of lead iodide, that would actually be a drop in energy, unfavorable for a hole uh, and thus uh, a barrier. So if there is no lead iodide, the um, uh, charges are collected very efficiently as shown here on the right, we don't have a barrier. And so this is one of the ways to be able to internally demonstrate this again was, was serendipitous. We didn't mean to have excess lead iodide in our cells, uh, at least not to this extent anyway. And uh, and we did, and it was able to demonstrate um, the phenomenon. Um, further, in uh, focusing on this lead iodide uh, stoichiometric issue, so whereas you have lead iodide, you have formal medium iodide, or combine them together, you make the perovskite material, you can have non-stoichiometric uh, 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 versions of that, of that material, and so you can have fully lead iodide here on the right, fully, um, we just say AX of ABX3, but say FAI um, on the left, and then stoichiometric um, FAPBI3 in the middle. If you drift off in either direction, we have found two really good ways to identify this. So one is in uh, admittance spectroscopy. And so at the low frequency uh, uh, regime here, or just the low frequency capacitance, we can see quite a significant number here that we associate with chemical capacitance like you would find in a battery, not geometric capacitance that's over here at the higher frequencies. And if we have compared to say, this is, we'll call this normal down here around 50 to 75. Um, if you have excessively higher than that, that's a strong indication of excess um, FAI running around freely inside of your thin film. Uh, and then in EQE, as we just showed, you have this hole here uh, in the uh, spectral response. That that's the light being absorbed by the lead iodide, not making it fully to the perovskite material. You know, some of it is, right? That's why it's a shadow. It's not a shield, just a shadow. So some of the light can't make it in the perovskite, but enough to have a nice impact um, on the EQE that we can we can measure. 
And then once we identify these two, these two aspects, um, we then were able to directly associate them with our stability data that we showed earlier. So just kind of bring all this, all this uh, together, right? So transitioning from, you know, light plus heat durability data to efficiency to the temperature coefficient and this particular um, uh, phenomenon here of the charge injection barrier and then stoichiometric effects. So we were actually able to successfully link in this case here, the low frequency capacitance, if it's high, you have a very poor, uh, very poorly durable uh, or robust cell. It'll start here all in a common efficiency number here, all at the same, but quickly decompose into garbage, right? But if you have balanced stoichiometry, as indicated with this orange and the lighter orange, <laughs> um, this device is quite, quite stable. I'll note these numbers here on the right are not are the uh, y-axis, they're not absolute. And so, yeah, if you have balanced stoichiometry, balanced meaning, is it stoichiometric, exactly ABX3? Maybe, maybe not, depends on your chemistry. So I won't go there. But if you have the right stoichiometry, you can have a very stable cell. If you have the wrong stoichiometry, you have a very poorly stable cell. You can go the opposite side here in BX2. Uh, you can see if we don't have enough FAI, the cell also quickly, uh, quickly decomposes. And these are the actual bits of data from these actual cells under, under test, not just representative data. Um, to, to wrap up, we'll show a couple other things. So additive chemistry, um, our most recent version has some additives in it. I, I won't say what, it's certainly not the, what we lovingly call the kitchen sink where it has just everything, potassium, rubidium, sodium, methyl ammonium, bromide, chloride, I don't know, biocyanate. All mixed in, we, we don't have anything like that, just we have a small bit, a little bit of additives. In this particular case, the one that we're using currently, this is how it made it into our standard process, where we started with what was the standard procedure at the time, added an increasing amount of this, uh, of this additive, and then we took all these samples and put them in a damp heat oven, um, unprotected. So there's absolutely no protection, no metal layers, no nothing, just bare perovskite on an ITO glass substrate. And you can see as you get to this uh, particularly well-balanced concentration of the additive that you have a very dark perovskite even after a thousand hours under these damp heat conditions, completely unprotected. Um, I'm not showing the data here, but if we have uh, transmit transmission spectroscopy, you can see that the, the perovskite itself has, has not changed. Our, at the band edge, we'll measure a maximum of 5% uh, derivation uh, of, in, in absorption or transmission. In our case, actually, it's absorptivity um, that we use um, over this this thousand hours. So you see some kind of a little bit of, of shadowing there, but all the perovskite is still there um, by absorptivity. Um, further, same additive. Uh, we have an Anton Par attachment for our XRD. So an Anton Par is a system that allows you to control the temperature and the atmosphere of the cell or of the sample under test, and we um, Put a thin film, again, unprotected under the ambient atmosphere. So we just open the Anton Par up and allow the atmosphere to flow through it. And we heated it up from 50 Celsius to 95 Celsius over the course, I believe, 36 hours. And you can see that um, right around 135, um, the cell or the sample, excuse me, starts to decompose and form lead iodide. But now you add this, again, this balanced concentration of the additive. And this does not happen up to 195. Um, the perovskite is quite um, quite stable. We start getting a little bit of wiggle at the higher temperature to let iodide, but that's probably a good thing um, for uh, for a variety of reasons. And then um, very quickly, a demonstration of uh, kind of the, the diverse approach. So you know we've already we've shown some you know efficiency results, how we make cells, some durability results. These are all kind of things that you would hopefully expect from a team like ours. But we have a very fundamental approach. We, we have a short, mid, and long-term uh, outlook on how we progress. So short-term is making the device tomorrow. Mid-term is developing a new material that we've used, say, in six weeks. And long-term is studying the fundamental behavior of the cell. Things like I mentioned in the beginning, we don't, we don't really fully understand yet what, what kind of physical properties and chemistry is going on inside of the cell. We need to understand that. And so one of the things we're using is density functional theory to back up our empirical data. And in this case here, we want to understand, can a unit of FAI actually leave the system? And how is that, 
you know, how does it manifest itself electronically? Um, how much energy is acquired thermodynamically? Um, in this case, you can see that a shallow trap actually forms here um, when you uh, remove an FAI unit, but it takes quite a bit of energy, over 1.1 EV. It's, it's, it takes a lot of energy to get the FAI out, right? In particular, if it's packaged up well, um, you have um, fusion. It's also going to help keep the FAI in place for the lack thereof. It's well packaged, rather. But if you add a little bit of water, in this case, a one-to-one -one ratio, one molecule of water for one molecule or one uh, FA form of modenium uh, cation, you can actually see that it drops below one, uh, one EV to remove this FA unit. Add a second molecule of water, and now we've had a significant drop. You know, we've cut it by about uh, um, you know, a little over a third um, or yeah, a little over a third of the energy that was originally required. And so this shows that under you know, these damp heat type conditions, if water can access the perovskite, it, the water itself, I, I know anybody who, who's listening, who's worked in perovskites understands that water and perovskites are not compatible. But that's the whole point here, right? It's something that we, that we knew, but we didn't really understand why. If I just dump water on it, sure, it just washes the salt away. But if I have just water vapor, um, uh, water vapor ingress in the cell uh, over test or in operation, what does that do? In that case, you're only going to have very small quantities of water, and we still will see the perovskite decompose. You know, what's actually happening? In this case here, through DFT calculations, we have demonstrated what water actually does with respect to the FA uh, cation um, when, it's, when it's degrading, right? So this is something we then take and then formulate empirical measurements or our device tests in the lab around to help us understand how we can better uh, protect the device, how we can make the device more robust, the material itself or the stack, and then eventually uh, more efficient. And then I'll conclude. Looks like I'm good on time here, despite the technical hiccups. And a few shots to the team and some really um, you know, uh, heartfelt acknowledgements out here to the, the team itself. You know, I'm the CTO, which means I don't do anything. This is all their work. Um, I just get on calls like this and talk about it. Um, they're the ones, they're the champions who make all this happen. Um, Joe Barry at NREL has been a phenomenal uh, collaborator uh, since the beginning, a uh, phenomenal human being, and the NREL staff at large have been absolutely uh, wonderful in helping us along the way. Uh, the very gracious Hunt family, I mentioned in the beginning they're they're quite diverse in their um, in their business dealings uh, and they're they're a traditional oil and gas company right 86 years old but they've been unbelievably supportive of this of this work um, they're true visionaries in this uh, in, in the new energy landscape uh, here in the 21st century 2020 and beyond uh, and to a most gracious audience thank you all for listening and again apologies you're not you're not supposed to apologize during presentation but technical snafus uh, sorry about that. Um, so I, I hope I didn't lose your attention along the way. And thank you. I'm open for any questions. All right, great, Michael. Th thanks uh, so much for a great talk. And we have some uh, time for some questions. Darius Kosiaskas from Enrol. Since your cells are, as you said, 18% or so efficient, uh, where do you think losses occur? <laughs> that is an excellent question, sir. Um, that's something we've been really focusing on as we scale. Um, so this same instrument that I show that does uh, temperature sweeps, it also does light intensity sweeps. Um, we actually, the newest version of it, the, the most recent iteration can sweep or scan uh, temperature, um, light intensity, and scan rate all concurrently. Um, and so through some low light measurements and some other, other resistance measurements, um, we found that almost all of our loss right now is in the TCO. Um, as you might imagine, um, you know, uh, as we scale, you know, ITO is only about 8 to 10 ohms per square. And then you heat it and anneal it. That affects it. You know the the tin oxide phase segregates from the indium oxide, um, which is a big issue. And we lose connectivity in the device fabrication process. So we have found that um, at lower light intensities um, and through modeling work, if we took our data exactly as it are as they are right now, 
and got our um, serious distance down, you know, less than five ohms uh, centimeter square where it needs to be, um, our fill factors would be over 80 percent, where they're hanging around 70, 70 something percent right now. And we would be in the, you know, 23 ish percent range is what our calculations say. I haven't demonstrated that yet. Um, but, but yeah, we feel like all of our losses right now are in an overly resistive um, TCO contact. Which there's ways to fix that, known ways to fix that. And we're working on that right now. So, so you don't think that that's the absorber each HTL interface or ETL interface, it's, it's the TCO? Yeah, we're, we're pretty confident. Um, that's, that's the issue. We feel that the, the internal device architecture um, charge transfer rates are, are very robust. You know, we worked with some of your colleagues on measurements like uh, time, resolved, uh, time resolved microwave connectivity, for example. And we feel like the charge injection from the perovskite into the contact layers is, is very efficient, uh, very quick. Um, we feel like the material itself uh, is also quite good absorbing the light. Um, the EQE response is getting flatter and flatter and higher and higher as we progress. So we feel very confident there. Uh, but yeah, all of our modeling, we're, we're showing that it's simply serious resistance at this stage that's holding us back. Now, of course, we'll solve that. And there'll be a new problem, right? Probably one of the ones you're discussing. <laughs> but that's the problem right now that we're facing is serious resistance. We, um, Michael, we have a question in the chat. Uh, it says, first of all, great presentation. And I agree with that. Thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, what do you see uh, the key barriers are from small area to large area? Is thickness uniformity one of them? Yeah, absolutely. As we showed here, this, um, you know, I, I, I show this all like it happened yesterday, right? Um, of course, it obviously didn't. Um, so to, to transfer from, from 50 to 150 was quite a bit of effort. It actually really kicked off last October. We had to make new test structures, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then just learn how to coat um, at a 9x area increase. And you can see clearly here you have, you know, these uh, streaks. Some of that's Marangoni, uh, Marangoni effects. Uh, you know, you have a lot, much larger area. So garbage can, it's, it's easier to get garbage onto the surface than it is on a 50 millimeter. You get a much bigger target. Um, and so, yeah, you have some marangonia like effects here in the, in the, um, in the drying, you have some streaking cause you can't get enough material all the way across the surface. Um, there's, you know, uh, the elimination issues. So everything that's an issue at the 25 or 50 millimeter size where a lot of folks work, those all amplify and non-linearly it's actually usually worse than nine X worse. Um, and so yes, uniformity is, uh, was, was quite a challenge. Uh, luckily, we overcame it because we have some really high quality people. Um, but if we didn't, it would, it would have been a real, real, real struggle. So uh, I'm curious about deposition strategies. Um, mm -hmm. are, are there a number of them, do you think? Or do you think um, there are or maybe one or two, you know, pathways to deposition. What, what are your thoughts about that? You know, uh, that's why, you know, I start off the value proposition of perovskite. That's not how that's a slide similar to that one used to be titled, this one here. Um, you know, a lot of horses of different colors, right? There's a lot of ways to, to approach this problem. And I think it really depends on the application, to be honest. If you're going to go after, you know, large area, you know, your, your utility scale, even residential or commercial, rigid substrate like glass or flexible substrate like willow glass or PET, PEN, you know, slot die coating is is a good approach. Um, others have other approaches like Soleil uses uh, inkjet printing, at least I still think they do. Um, some folks prefer vapor deposition. You know, it's really, I think it's up to I think it's really up to the application and, and and meeting the application's need. If the surface is not flat, would slot die coating be the best approach? Um, and again, from our perspective, to really capture the value proposition of the perovskite system, of the metal halide perovskite system, it has to be printed. If you're not printing it, you're still using elevated, you know, highly elevated temperatures, vacuum systems that can be 
cumbersome, large, very expensive, have large footprints. So our personal belief, um, not everyone may share this, but our personal belief is that you're not capturing the value unless you're printing by some, some method. Okay, great. Um, so maybe one more question and then uh, we probably got to jump off. Um, Can I ask so, a question? Uh, yeah, let, well, let, let's do two more. So real quick, one from the chat and then, then one more. I, I got a few minutes too if we got a few more. So no okay, rush on my cool. side. Um, so quick question, are your cells encapsulated in a glove box and how much interest is there for encapsulation R&D for perovskites and what would you like to see in terms of advancements in packaging? That's an excellent question. And my favorite way to answer that is in um, chelation chemistry, right? So lead sequestration. Um, there's a lot of reasons to package up a cell to protect it from the elements to keep it performing. But in the dramatic case where the cell is damaged, either by some accident or act of God, and people are concerned if that happens, lead is going to get out. Um, a, few, a few of my colleagues are already working on this, but I still think it's a very important topic that we have to make sure we have good encapsulation technologies that can sequester the lead if it has an opportunity to leave due to fracture or breakage of some sort. Uh, a common way is through ke uh, chelation chemistry. This is how normally um, metal ion sequestration occurs anyway, like EDTA being the most common example. Um, so I think from a packaging standpoint, that's the most important thing. Um, obviously, if you want to make it more durable to the elements, that's, that's great too. But I think the job number one is to take this great invention, this great gift that we've been given in perovskites, and not have it run by politics, that we, we have a cell that's wonderful and efficient and it's low cost, having this very significant socioeconomic impact globally, particularly in the developing countries, and then had the whole thing quashed um, by this lead issue. And if we can address it now, long before it gets to market, I think that's job one. Let's, let's don't waste the gift, the gift given. Absolutely. So yeah, Nitin, I think. Yes. Yeah. Michael, great talk, thank you. Uh, so I had a more of a philosophical question regarding which technology is going to succeed first, your single junction photovoltaics, prospect photovoltaics, or tandem with silicon? You just had to ask, ask a provocative question, didn't you, Nitin? Thank you, sir. You know, it's a, that's an excellent question, and there are a lot of economic factors at play. You know, the reason why when we, had, we, we reached a junction ourselves, no pun intended, where we had to make a decision to continue to pursue single junction versus a tandem device, a two junction device or four terminal even, um, that we felt, at least let's just say me, so I don't speak for others. I felt why would I want to take this burgeoning lead perovskite decomposing garbage and coat it on a really nicely well-functioning silicon cell. Just why would I want to run this beautiful silicon cell with this decomposing junk. Um, so I know that's a real negative thing to say, but the, the uh, philosophy was that we really had to have a well-functioning single junction before you could even think about making a tandem. And again, that's just my own personal philosophy that others may not share. Um, now, commercially, the best parallel that I see, it's not a perfect parallel, but the best one that I see is bifacial solar. Bifacial has been out for quite some time. So, you know, you got an amorphous uh, silicon cell essentially layered on the back side of a crystal, a uh, single crystalline cell. You know, the light passes through the cell, not some of it's absorbed, some of it's not. Ideally, the light hits the substrate behind you, be it grass or sand or dirt, and reflects back up and it hits the cell again. So you can collect a little more energy. I believe you can get up to maybe a 20% boost in performance when the bifacial cell is working perfectly but it's dependent on the surface, right? So there's a lot of variables we don't need to get into, um, but people have had a hard time um, assigning value to a bifacial cell, even four years given, right? So it's just an add on to an existing technology. And how do you uh, prove the bankability and prove the economics of this, of this add on? And I'm afraid that the silicon perovskite tandem may end up in that trap. I don't know for sure, but that's just one example that we've gotten to witness. We had the opportunity to witness over the last, uh, last four years. Um, fundamentally, the perovskite single junction cell is fully capable of hitting 
Uh, we've done lots of modeling. That model is continuously growing with new data as we get it. But we've modeled it out, and 29% is totally achievable in a single junction perovskite solar cell. And so there's no reason why this system can't stand on its own. But if we want to exceed 90, you know, 29%, then there probably is a tandem in the future. But I believe the single junction can stand on its own uh, for now. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, one more quick te technical question. So about the sample submerged in water, is it unprotected? So it has the same architecture that we show there. It's not hermetically sealed, um, but it does have, if I get it to play, there we go. Um, it does have that architecture that's shown there. And again, I, I said this is kind of kitschy. The, the liquid water is not that accessible to the perovskite material, right? With some level of encapsulation, it's the gas, right? So the, the water vapor is slowly um, penetrating the, uh, um, the epoxy in this case. That's, what, uh, that's what's eating the cell. The cool thing is that we can leave this boiling for up to 14 hours and still have a, a well-performing cell before the decomposition um, really starts to set in. This particular example that we recorded only is good for about seven or eight hours, but uh, anyway, All right, hope that great. answers the question. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, if anyone has one last quick question. Uh, I, uh, can I, uh, yeah, thank you very much. This is James yeah. Smart, Colin from 3M. Yeah, it's great, yeah. Uh, impressive uh, presentation. So a question for Mike, you know, you have uh, pretty good efficiency, you know, 18 to 20%. That is pretty good and also pretty good durability. So mm -hmm. what do you see uh, the key barrier you know, when we can see su you know, successful commercialization? Yeah, you know, different perovskite companies have had different approaches. Some companies have gone after a particular um, printing technique or coding technique. Some people have gone after just purely scale. Um, in our case, you know, you can almost think of this I don't know if I'd repeat this, but you can almost think of us as more of a materials company where yeah. we wanted to prove the perovskite, right? Which is the fundamental, the crux of all this, because if the perovskite can't hold up, it can't become an efficient semiconductor. We have nothing here. There is no value if the perovskite itself doesn't have intrinsic value. Um, yeah. And that's been our approach. And so, um, and so far our scaling work, you know, I'm going to knock on wood with both hands um, has gone gone quite well. I love to use the analogy internally of, uh, of the Karate Kid. We've done a lot of waxing on, a lot of waxing off, a lot of fences have been painted, and that has made the team really well apt to, to, to progress quickly in the, um, in the scaling and the manufacturability components of, of this project. And so um, a lot of it really is at this stage, quite honestly, this may sound very arrogant, but um, it's just a matter of time and money at this stage. Uh, cool. We feel like the technology has been proven out. We feel like that we have solved the critical issues, answered the critical questions, and with the application of the right amount of time and money, um, we're going to get this thing to market. Now, we got to be careful because silicon and prices is dropping rather rapidly, so there is a window that we have to, we have to fit through, um, but luckily yeah. that window is pretty, pretty far out, uh, well into the almost 2030 um, before this loses its market's uh, markability. So yeah, so you feel that the material is uh, maybe it's uh, uh, readily you know maybe a bit uh, ready, maybe the process right you know the uniformity of the uh, large area, mm -hmm. other things encapsulation right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, all right. You feel pretty confident about the material. That's very critical, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I Great. I. Uh... I'd have a hard time giving this presentation with a straight face if, if I wasn't confident in it. So Great. yeah, so yeah I, I, I feel 100% sold on this. Um, it, I've been in this for seven years now. So either for me, I either have to be completely confident or totally jaded by now. And so I'll go with the former, the former category. <laughs> I, I like confident as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Um, anyone else have a last question? Okay. Um, if not, then uh, let's thank Michael again. A really fantastic talk. I mean, it's super exciting 
uh, from my perspective to see all the work uh, you've done, Michael. It's uh, fascinating and uh, really, really uh, kind of energizing. Yeah, excuse the pun. So uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks for thanks to everyone for joining, and uh, there will be a recording of of the uh, talk also on our center's YouTube channel. Um, so for those of you who don't know the, the Center for Next Generation Photovoltaics very well. We have a YouTube channel with all of our uh, distinguished lecture series talks and a range of really great things with cadmium telluride, SIGs, silicon, um, and a number of other topics. So we'll have it posted up there. So thanks again for, for joining in. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks, Michael. That was a great presentation. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.